Hi, my name is Kate Kelly. I'm an undergraduate senior and a member of the Bass Connections team called Arts in the Anthropocene, where our team has worked to create an arts-based solution to the climate crisis in North Carolina. Today, our team will share with you an experimental presentation featuring most of our team members. We have made use of the Pecha Kucha presentation format to tell you the story of our Bass Connections. Pecha Kuchas are succinct, image-driven narratives with time slides that change every 20 seconds. You'll be hearing about our essential questions, our research process, and the art making that we've engaged in over this past year, culminating in our upcoming installation, which opens on April 22nd. After our presentation, we're gonna also have a little bit of time to engage in a Q&A session. We hope you enjoy learning about the work our team has done. Hi, I'm Raquel Sabatella. Jonathan Henderson and I are leading this team together, and I'm going to start by giving a short description of the project and also introducing the other team members. Jonathan and I are slowly becoming long-time collaborators. Today, our collaborations have addressed human and environmental crises in distant places and have sought to explore how art can facilitate and enrich the discourse about them. Recently, we both felt the need to focus for a change on pressing environmental issues here at home and on the human causes and to engage the local and academic communities in the exploration of those issues. A bus connection project seemed like the perfect solution. These projects are meant to bring together a diverse group of academics and students to shed light on a topic of choice in a multidisciplinary collaboration. We titled our proposal, Arts and Anthropocene, Crisis and Resilience in North Carolina Waterways. I want to show you some, picture of, some pictures of all our team members while I briefly explain our approach. The Anthropocene has been framed by scholars and act activists as the current geological period during which human activity has had a fundamental influence on the climate and environment. Human impacts on atmospheric, biological, geological and marine systems have distorted natural rhythms. And these transformations have ecological and social implications, um, particularly for communities living in proximity to water. Along the interconnected webs of waterways, coastlines, and barrier islands, communities in North Carolina are grappling with how to plan for and respond to this seismic shift in our surrounding environment and the corresponding impact of storm surge, sea level rise, flooding, and contamination. Guaranteeing human dignity and achieving sustainability in the Anthropocene requires collabor collaborative action, diverse knowledge, and different modes of storytelling. Anim animating scientific uh, facts while narrating possibilities for action and coexistence. Our Bass Connections project proposes to contribute to this effort, exploring how the arts can mobilize the imaginative powers and moral intelligence of human communities in an era that requires us to reimagine the relationship between humans and the non-human world. More specifically, the art and Anthropocene explores how visual, theatrical, and sonic art can play a role in educating various publics, provoking action, and prefiguring resilient futures in the area of the Anthropocene. As the team will now explain in more detail, we started the year-long project last semester by exploring how both scientists and artists of all stripes have sought to address social and ecological crises and entanglements. Then in the spring, we moved toward curating and constructing our own art intervention aimed at illuminating manifestations of the Anthropocene in the context of North Carolina waters. North Carolina's waterways are the lifeblood of our state. A quick look at hydrological maps suggests an image of the state's tributaries and rivers as the vascular system of this land. Smaller vessels flowing into arteries, consolidating and intermingling before pouring out into the intertidal zone where land and sea meet. We designed our fall semester course as a laboratory in research creation. Engaging scientific research, students responded in artistic modes. Engaging artists, the data and science hovered in the frame. Our goal was to figure out how these multiple modes of inquiry might reflect, refract, reference, reinforce, or reframe one another. As Natalie Loveless describes, quote, the interdisciplinarity modeled by research creation argues for multiple formal outputs that, while sometimes dissonant in terms of their languages, are equally weighted as objects of and contributions to knowledge, end quote. We cycled through a praxis of research, creation, reflection, 
all of which in turn demanded new questions. Along the way, we aimed to foster a pedagogical space in which the whole team would engage in an inductive collaborative process. Students responded to our research sessions in creative ways, prose, poetry, visual art, sound recordings. One student, for instance, responded to our session on the deep sea with a painting and a poem. Kendall Jeffries wrote, how do we paint in the dark? Monet painted light watching water lilies from the same place. Light creates new spaces. Stand still and the world around you moves. A thousand feet deep, the sunlight dies, eaten by the sea. How do we paint life that does not know our colors? How do we paint in the dark? What I love about this poem is how it calls our attention to the edges of human imagination and understanding. In reckoning with the Anthropocene, we grapple with ecological forces and time scales that the mind strains to process. I'd argue that art can help us build a felt connection with such abstract concepts and can help us imagine futures that lie at the edge of our vision. You'll hear from students and team members today who will describe our research in the fall, the collaborative art proposals they developed, and the multimodal art installation and story map collection that we've been producing since January. I'm going to pass it off to Kendall now, who will tell you a bit about the arc of our fall semester. Introduce, uh, she'll also introduce the guests who graciously visited our class to discuss their research, their activism, and their art making. Our guest speakers range from environmental and deep sea scientists to activists, playwrights, photojournalists, and filmmakers. From river keepers to composers of river sounds, each of our guests taught us new ways of perceiving the Earth's flight, sharing creative tools and ideas for communicating our current environmental crises through art. Many scientists believe we've entered a new epoch. The Anthropocene denotes our current geological time period in which a human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. But a wealth of alternative concepts exists. We started off the semester by considering these alternatives, which complicate our understanding by asking both how we got here and who is responsible. We then dove into the deep. Cindy Van Dover at Duke Marine Lab brought artists to the deep sea and her lab studies the impact of the deep sea mining. They realized that mining grants fell along the path of the Middle Passage, the final resting place of enslaved persons who died on the voyage. PhD student Philip Turner shared his work in proposing a memorial to honor the victims. Many of our speakers also focus on protecting our waterways and advocating for environmental justice. Indigenous activist Crystal Cavalier Keck spoke about her work against the Mountain Valley Pipeline extension that would have cut through Indigenous lands. We also learned about coal ash spilling into North Carolina waterways from Caroline Armijo at the Lilies Project. Much of our work centers around the threat of sea level rise. We heard from Stan Riggs, an expert on the geology of North Carolina. We learned that visual cues of sea level rise, such as cypress trees that have germinated on land and now are submerged. Dr. O.J. at Duke and Laura Moore also spoke about a play they're writing that brings the impact of sea level rise to life. We also explored sonic art. We heard from Anil Lockwood, who recorded the river and composed a sound map of the Danube. We also delved into our own experience with river listening, for often the natural world holds mysteries and answers we cannot put into words. With each of these guests, we dove more deeply into issues relating to human environmental relationships. In small teams, we developed proposals for art projects. These art installations would engage their audiences and provoke them into thinking deeply about North Carolina's waterways and the issues facing the human communities that rely on them for their livelihoods and for their daily activities. The Spectral Seas team reflected on sea level rise in North Carolina's coastal communities. The team hoped to create woven sculptures of colorful waves from recycled materials such as plastic bags. This graph represents the projected rise in sea level over the next century. They used this graph as their design inspiration to express the urgency of sea level rise. The In Too Deep team played with photographs by overlaying them with patterns and sculpture to reflect the personal stories of those impacted by rising seas and inland flooding events. They plan to partner with Justin Cook for the photographs of coastal communities and the people who reside in them. The Kitchen from the Black Lagoon team explored the question of what happens to your once pristine home when your overuse of water comes back to haunt you. 
They developed an immersive installation with surround sound speakers, flopping fish, and strands of seaweed strewn everywhere. The reimagining flow team reflected on how to encourage better use of water through painting murals, finding community values, and exploring innovative ways of gardening in urban spaces. The team was interested in bringing the Durham community into their work by placing the installation downtown and inviting community members to join. The Drink Clean team looked at 3D image and video projection on water as a way to present the issue of contaminated drinking water in an exciting, unexpected, and engaging format. The Duke Pond was one location they thought of to display this installation. After considering everyone's art proposals, our group decided as a team to focus on the issue of sea level rise on North Carolina's coast. We will use the colorful graph and woven wave idea presented by the Spectral Seas team as the starting point for our work on this installation. Coastal communities in North Carolina are facing a range of impacts due to sea level rise, and most of the effects are amplified by the Anthropocene and human-induced climate change. North Carolina is especially vulnerable to the increased rate of sea level rise in the future. From impacting forests to highways to even bobcats, sea level rise poses a dangerous threat to North Carolina's coast. On the left, we have the current elevation of North Carolina's coast, Regions in purple are especially vulnerable to sea level rise and king tides due to their proximity to sea level. As you can see by the GIF on the right, the depth of flooding in Wrightsville, North Carolina is steadily increasing, posing a great risk to that community. The increase in sea level rise can also negatively impact ecosystems. On the left is a picture of a ghost forest, or rather, trees that have died due to the increase of salt water in swamps, killing trees that provide refuge for many North Carolina species, such as bobcats, snakes, turtles, herons, alligators, and even more. Flooding has also become a more pressing problem in coastal cities. North Carolina is vulnerable to flooding even without heavy rains due to the increase of king tides and seawater splurging into the streets. Hurricanes also become more damaging due to stronger storm surges, and since climate change has caused hurricanes to become more frequent, this is a very pressing problem. The iconic NC Highway 12 has been slowly retreating into the sand, causing North Carolina governments to spend thousands of dollars removing and replacing sand and also repairing the highway. Retreating shores are also affecting homes, as shown in the top right. Preventing the sand erosion and destruction has become extremely costly to the government. Though we love the beautiful landscapes, wildlife, and ecosystems of North Carolina's coast, as scientists, we tend to forget the impact sea level rise has on people in the community. We learned from photojournalist Justin Cook about one specific place where rising sea levels are impacting coastal communities right here in North Carolina. I'm Justin, and my grandfather was from the Outer Banks, and since 2017, I've been photographing and reporting on a tiny 150-year-old cemetery that's slowly washing into the Pamlico Sound as a result of erosion that's being caused by human development of the island and increasingly violent hurricanes and sea level rise caused by climate change. Salvo Community Cemetery is just south of the village of Salvo inside the Salvo Day Use Area, which is managed by the National Park Service and it's the most popular recreation area on the Outer Banks. I've been documenting the efforts to preserve the cemetery, the impact of erosion on the marsh ecosystem around it, and the locals a deep connection to this restless sliver of sand. This is a picture of the cemetery from the 1970s. You can see how much land is in front of it. And that's it in 2017. Scientists believe that six feet of global sea level rise by the end of the century threatens to inundate the Outer Banks completely. And the effects are being felt today. Much of this is due to the highway and beachfront homes that prevent sand from washing over the islands during storms, which naturally causes them to grow and migrate towards the mainland. Burning fossil fuels has raised atmospheric CO2 levels from 280 to 414 parts per million in only the last 150 years or in the same time since the first grave was dug in the Salvo Community Cemetery in the 1870s. This has warmed the global climate, creating stronger, longer lasting hurricanes and sea level rise that wreak havoc on the islands. 
This tiny strip of land is remarkable because studying it and the people connected to it reveals the effects of climate change on the land, the ecosystem, and on folks' mental health and this, their sense of home. Through reporting, I met Jean Hooper here, 85, who was born in Salvo and lived there all her life. And she still wants to be buried in a cemetery beside her husband and grandparents, even if the sea eventually takes their bones. This is her in the cemetery of her siblings and cousins back in the 40s. These photos are her prized possession, or some of her prized possessions. That's her late husband, Burtis. And that's their family plot at the cemetery. I also met Jenny Creech and Don Taylor, who have ancestors buried there and help lead efforts to preserve the plot of land. They're experiencing eco anxiety and soul nostalgia, or a homesickness and grief that some Outer Banks locals feel as climate change renders their home unfamiliar. These are tourists at the cemetery. This is a live oak that was drowned by saltwater intrusion and it died. And these are the, the, erosion, the eroding marsh area. Dave's area is also home to a lot of wildlife, including some climate endangered birds, and, um, such as this willet, which is a species of sandpiper. The Outer Banks are a critical buffer that protects mainland North Carolina from the full force of hurricanes. They also contain sound side estuaries and marshes that, like sponges, absorb floodwaters and force the storm wave, the force of storm waves, which is which in turn protects the islands from erosion. These estuaries are teeming with life, including with crabs, snails, oysters, plankton, this hermit crab, <laughs> and sharks. As the island withers, these ecosystems are threatened. And without the Outer Banks, hurricane storm surges will become increasingly catastrophic for mainland coastal communities and those further inland, particularly communities of color. These threats to their home and to natural, coastal, and economic resources are why communities on the coast are working towards plans for resilience for climate change. As the Outer Banks and other coastal areas are affected by global climate change, the residents in these communities, like the people that Justin touched on, are feeling this soul nostalgia. These are their homes. They want to stay in these places that they have ties to despite the imminent dangers of sea level rise, natural disasters, and coastal erosion. Co conflict arises between short-term and long-term solutions. Should we hold on to and replenish the beaches that time and time again are being eroded? How do we protect the communities here while also managing the dangers of waves and storms? How can we better plan for a future that is likely to see even higher sea levels and more frequent hurricanes? Resilience is defined as increasing your community's ability to rebound, positively adapt to or thrive amidst changing conditions or challenges, including disasters and climate change, and maintain quality of life, healthy growth, durable systems, and conservation of resources for present and future generations. Coastal resilience solutions come in a number of forms, structural, non-structural, and other solutions like policy and planning. These all aim to achieve things like protect from flooding and existing infrastructure, plan landscapes and communities for future storm events, or prepare and educate residents to respond. Structural solutions are built structures along the coastlines. For example, seawalls are vertical constructions that act as a defense against wave energy to the coast. Breakwater systems absorb the energy of the waves offshore before it reaches land. Shoreline armoring focuses more on coastal erosion by preventing movement of beaches. Non-structural solutions focus more on natural and ecosystem-driven remedies. Dune stabilization protects beaches from erosion. Living breakwaters use reef stones and oyster beds to enhance biodiversity and alleviate surge risks. Living shorelines are green spaces that grow over time to continuously buffer storm surges and flooding. Other solutions center around policy and planning decisions in these communities. Governmental databases such as floodplain mapping and forecast models are especially crucial in informing citizens as well. As disasters occur, it's important to continue bouncing back from and adapting within community and state responses to improve resilience for the future. Policy in North Carolina addressing climate change and coastal resiliency has lagged due to the political climate in the state. 
While the sea level rise assessment report was published in 2010, a House bill in 2012 restricted the ability of the Coastal Commission to utilize any science to create projects or policy changes in the state. With an update to that report needed in 2020 and a slight shift in political climate as well as an urgency on the coast as storms worsened, the update of the climate risk assessment began resilience planning for the state. The North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency are tasked with defining what it means to build and plan for resilient communities. State bio programs are one way North Carolina and the federal government are adapting to coastal, coastal risk in an effort to relocate communities to reduce impacts to infrastructure and use of recovery funds later, Rebuild North Carolina provides owners a chance to sell and relocate. Duck North Carolina residents <clears throat> are most concerned about shoreline erosion, town drainage, hurricanes, and flooding from heavy rain events. With guidance from DCM and as well as grants provided, Duck is undergoing projects to create resilient living shorelines to protect from storm surge and erosion. <clears throat> Swansboro took a different approach uh, with the help of some funders uh, and that are identifying future hazards in their land use plans. A priority, a conservation priority area mapping layer uh, was created and is used to concentrate development and public infrastructure away from high risk areas <clears throat> or environmentally significant areas. However, projects are not eliminating the impacts and they're not reducing the cost to these communities. Communities across North Carolina are still experiencing the vast impacts from sea level rise and coastal flooding. To assess the impacts to communities, we look to artists who are responding to the topic of sea level rise in their own work. Carolina coast, I got the opportunity to fly over it where I took this photo. I found you cannot fully appreciate the coast from ground level. An aerial view brings into relief the lace-like patterns of intermingled land, sea, and fresh water. I wanted to seek out art that illustrated the idea of shorelines as living, breathing spaces where sea levels like the diaphragm expanding and contracting. Mary Edna Fraser, whom you might remember from our week on the deep sea, has also collaborated with another scientist at the Marine Lab to communicate about climate change and shorelines. Her series of batiks on silk capture the delicacy and serpentine shapes of land and sea at the coast, providing an aerial perspective on these liminal spaces. Briggs' book, I was struck by the maps depicting the layers of sediment beneath the sea and how these are also beneath our very feet on land due to changes in sea level throughout history. In this piece, I can see the variegated segment and feel its texture, sensing the slow march of sand and mud downstream and feel the give and take of water and earth that occurs over both short time scales and deep time. In this boutique of barrier islands, the islands appear to me like some otherworldly species still becoming, creatures in an embryonic state, a fern still unfurling, the delicate remnant shells of creatures hatched. These islands are living, moving, shape-shifting, built, transported, and destroyed by storm energy, and at the same time, protecting our inshore worlds from storms. Lines is an art installation on a remote island in Scotland by two Finnish artists, Pekka and Timo. Their work brings greater awareness to the risks of sea level rise using LED lights, starkly illuminating lines that indicate future sea level. These bright lines foretell the eventual inundation and annihilation of this very island. By use of sensors, the installation interacts with the rising tidal changes, activating on high tide. The work provides a visual reference of future sea level rise. I found the mechanical simplicity of this work, a beam of pure white light activated as buoys bob in the daily ebb and flow of tides to be effective and the message harrowingly clear. You can see exactly what will be lost. For our Bass Connections project, we began to develop our own vision for the weaving design for our project. We started out by researching the level of sea level rise in North Carolina specifically and global sea level rise and came across these two graphs which show the different levels of, of severity of sea level rise, the so predicted scenarios, each which has uh, a specific number of feet um, from moderate to severe, to severe sea level rise on the coast and globally. Um, and the graph on the right was very instrumental in developing our design for this project. We uh, researched many artists that utilized trash from the ocean and uh, plastic bottle, bottles and aluminum cans. And these artists created 
um, water like structures and wave like structures to show the pollution of the ocean and sea level rise, which we wanted to encapsulate by using recycled materials to form our art. And as you can see in these images, these also formed the basis for our um, inspiration for our project. And these used gift ribbon to create a woven structure. And the image on the right really represents like a waterfall and a water structure. And the ones on the right show like a woven structure that could be structured to create levels of sea level rise. And so this really formed the basis of our um, project. And then going off of that, we used the graph on the left as a baseline to create our image, our vision for um, our project. And so we each came up with a mock-up design of what our project would look like. And as you can see, um, these varied from individual to individual, some being more of a drawn, a hand-drawn um, image like the one in the middle or a Photoshopped uh, model prediction as shown on the right. And from these, we all discussed um, and had many meetings and we came up with this final design. And we, we compromised over um, having pom-poms -pom -pom at the bottom and at the top to create a dynamic wave shape. Um, the top pom-poms -pom symbolizes like the foaminess of the wave and this and the different levels uh, represent each scenario of um, each scenario severity from moderate to severe. And the, the pom-poms over the top show how, um, how severe the sea level rise is. And in addition, we're gonna have sound and video projected onto the weaving, the woven part of the weaving to create a more, um, a more engaging exhibit for viewers. The first puzzle was to figure out how we would make this weaving. We first debated three strategies of weaving, a tile design of interlocked bags, a shag design of bags tethered to an old fishing net, and almost a knitting technique where we cut plastic shopping bags into what we dubbed plarn and then wove on a loom. Below are photos of our initial workshop where we experimented with these methods. Here, we are looking at mock-ups that the team made in small groups. After thoroughly thinking through, collaborating, and sketching mock-ups, we decided that we should weigh the pros and cons of each design. We agreed that a combination of the plarn and shagging techniques would work best to portray our message effectively. Next came immense amounts of research and planning. We consulted experts like Donovan Zimmerman to help our team properly account for structural scaffolding and Francis Hayden to guide us through the proper mechanisms of using a loom and correct weaving techniques. We use this new knowledge to finalize our design. Next came the construction of the large loom. This loom had to be a scale model of the actual size we wanted our tapestry weaving to be, six feet wide and 11 feet, seven inches high. We had to account for anchorage points, the location of the display site, and many other auxiliary factors. Once the loom was made, we were able to begin making plarn and weaving. The team carefully, uniformly recycled bags into strips of plarn. Once the materials were all prepped and ready to weave, we spooled up the strips onto a shuttle to prevent tangling. We also used tools like a comb to make the pattern uniform. Raquel was actually able to laser cut these tools specifically for our project. Finally, color played a large role throughout our planning and creation of the weaving. The team decided on color quite intentionally as to portray future impacts of sea level rise while also presenting an artful composition. Even the way we aligned colors next to each other was considered. Because of our focus on this element, we dyed some of the bags to achieve the right visual element. Though we focused a lot on color, we also wanted to use multimedia in our installation project. We began by thinking about how we could use projection to help tell us a deeper story about sea level rise here in North Carolina. We wanted to complement the weaving sculpture which meant working with its layout. We felt that the purpose of multimedia storytelling was to add life to the weaving. And one way to do that was to create movement with our video so that it would add texture, add to the texture already in the weaving. For example, simulating 
the movement of waves. Thematically, we felt a way to do that was also to think about the larger issue of sea level rise in North Carolina, how to portray its impact on humans, wildlife, urban environments, and on forestry, for example. We thought about using shadow work to portray humans or using photography from the outer banks to create a human element to the projection. We had a lot to think about. Would it be more abstract visuals or more literal ones? We carried out a lot of projection tests to see what kinds of lighting, colors, and textures worked best. We also tried to anticipate how it would look using vertical storyboards. The storyboarding process took several weeks. We decided to break up our story into four, one for each person. We thought about sharing stories about wildlife and forestry, human life, cities, and this way we thought we could go from stage to stage in our story to create a narrative. Working within the blues of the sculpture, we felt we could use warm colors, for example, corals, oranges, and reds. Alternatively, we had to focus on not making color too saturated. Each person's style was individual, so we also worked hard to ensure that our individual clips linked to the one before it and the one that came next. All of us used a lot of different sources of inspiration in order to tell our story. We thought about color stories, textures that evoked emotions, and we recalled our experiences with nature in order to create something that was immersive for the viewer. We also thought a lot about transitions for our nar narrative. And that's how we went about creating a cohesive projection video by thinking uh, extensively about color, texture, transitions, and tying it all together with a compelling narrative. And we're incredibly excited to see the outcome. Story Sims. Uh, our video projection uh, will show the tremendous impact that sea level rise has made on us and nature. By working with several video production techniques, such as video composition, color grading, and animation, we create both realistic and conceptual moving images. And we hope our video projection can allow the audience to examine the real problem while thinking about the future possibilities and the impact of sea level rise. For the wildlife sim, we depict several animals who live at the outer bank that are impacted by sea level rise, transiting from marine animals like dolphin, crop, and seabirds to terrestrial animals. We use the peaceful and beautiful images of animals' live lives to invoke the audience thinking and imagination of how sea level rise can influence and harm wildlife. Science to it here. The story transits into the forestry theme, starting with the image of grasses, leaves, and the geometry of plants such as lines on woods, vines and leaves, designed in the vivid color, and we gently transit into the black and white to create a spectrum atmosphere. In this way, we hope to portray the death of greenery and life-sustaining mechanisms in forests along the shoreline. The part ends with an image of waves, and it gradually zooms out into a glass of contaminated drinking water. Here we go into the human life's sim. By zooming in from a glass of water, we transit into an image of mold crabbing up the walls and the family filling the whole space. To conceptually portray the impacts of sea level rise on humans, we use a figure of a person that sinks through the water. Uh, with the falling of this person, the story also goes into the city's part. In the city section, we focus on several aspects that sea level rise impact on urban life. By using the impact of for factories with smoke spreading in the air, we serve with the global warming issue, which is one of the main factors of sea level rise. With the composition of waves and horses, we hope to reflect floods and hurricanes, which impacted our local lives a lot. Finally, we use the image of the destroyed horses and the damaged road 12 road to portray the consequence of those disasters. We use image of the lighthouse submerged by rising water to highlight North Carolina's relationship with sea level rise issue. The whole video ending with a shadow of a hand covered by waves, 
We hope to use this impressive image to invoke the audience's deep thinking of the sea level rise issue. As a way of providing additional context for our installation, our team decided to make a series of story maps. We used the ArcGIS, a digital web-based application, to share our project in a more narrative way. So we worked in three different teams to develop the story maps. So each team focuses on a specific topic. And we have um, the science of sea level rise. We have local impact stories, and also the story about uh, ourselves, the best connections. And we started with telling stories about sea level rise in a more scientific way for this one. We've covered what the sea level rise is, why it matters for human beings, and what effects that sea level rise bring to the North Carolina coast. The second story map is about how the sea level rise affects our local community. In this one, you can easily zoom into a specific location on a map and explore uh, different local stories throughout the website. Last but not least, our third story map is about ourselves. So we will go through with you about who we are, what brings us together, uh, what we learned from the last uh, two semesters and what we did for making all of those happen. Definitely, we will publish the story map online on the day of our opening. For those of you who are interested but cannot make it in person, we hope that uh, our story maps can give you a comprehensive overview on our journey. Thank you for being with us today to hear about our exhibit. We're really excited to have been able to present and talk with y'all. Our Exhibit will be opening on Earth Day, April 22nd, in accordance with our environmental theme. It will be on view in the Ruby, right in the lobby to all those who pass by, and we're hoping they'll gain a lot of attention and a lot of viewers. This is a mock-up of what it might look like. Um, it should take up about one whole window with the tapestry and wave installation. And we are excited because they'll be right there in the center in front of the ruby. We hope that all members of Duke community and even members outside of Duke community with permission granted around COVID factors can see and enjoy, appreciate, and learn from this exhibit. Thank you so much. We'll be now hosting a panel to hear any questions. Uh, we thank you for your time and hope you are able to see the exhibit. <laughs>